The fact of your own existence is the most astonishing fact you'll ever have to confront. Don't you dare ever get used to it. Don't you dare ever say that life is boring, monotonous, or joyless. One obvious way to express this is the improbability of your own personal existence. Of course, with hindsight, the probability of your existence is one, since you're here. <laughs> But that's the hindsight of a lottery winner. The probability of winning a big lottery before you go in for it is so close to zero as to render it an irrational decision. Unless, which is not totally irrational, you gain measurable happiness from a flickering glimmer of forlorn hope. I don't need to spell out the argument. Uh, your parents had to meet, they had to copulate on a particular occasion, a particular sperm had to penetrate a particular egg, and even that wasn't enough to determine your personal identity, because after that fertilized egg was formed, it might have split to become a pair of identical twins. I can't get my head around the question of whether, if that had happened, one of those twins would have been you, and if so, which one? And of course, the same conditions had to be true for your grandparents, your great-grandparents, all the way back through the, this wonderful film that we've just seen, I wish we could have seen more of it, uh, all the way back to the origin of life. Uh, as I've put it before, if the third dinosaur to the left of the tall cycad tree had not happened to sneeze at exactly the moment when he did, your umpteenth great-grandparents would never have met. You wouldn't be here. And the same goes for the existence of every species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, and so on. The following is a fact. There once was a species, all interbreeding, split into two. One half, or some kind of geographical accident split it. One half was destined to become us, and the half of the animal kingdom to which we belong. The other half was destined to become, shall we say, an octopus, and the half of the animal kingdom to which the octopuses belong. So the existence of every phylum, class, order, etc., is a contingency depending upon a series of freak accidents which uh, had almost vanishingly unlikely probability of happening. But this emphasis on improbability raises a danger of a grave misunderstanding. And the misunderstanding is this. There's so much chance about, so much contingency, You might run away with the idea that evolution itself is a process of chance, a process of luck. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is chance which particular species are here, which particular individuals are here, but it's very much not chance that there are some individuals here, some species. And moreover, we can say a lot about the properties that the animals that would be here anyway would have had. There is luck, there is contingency, it's massive luck and contingency with respect to individuals and species. But there is a force that's constantly dragging the evolutionary process back on course. Not in detail, but in general. As it happens, Australia is a particularly good place to talk about this. For Australian mammals evolved separately and independently from the rest of the world over the same period. So it's almost as though some godlike being at the time of the breakup of the great southern continent of Gondwana planned a beautiful natural experiment. Let's run the mammal experiment twice, actually more than twice, because South America too was an island at the time. Let's run the mammal experiment at least three times and see what happens. And the remarkable thing, is, as you know, is that much the same thing happened. There is a force, it's natural selection, there is a force that's pulling evolution in similar directions, not identical, it's nothing like a kangaroo in the rest of the world, but in similar directions. And so we have in Australia uh, marsupial mice, marsupial moles, marsupial flying squirrels, marsupial rabbits, marsupial wolves, and so on. So I'm juxtaposing the extreme luck of our individual existence with the extreme, not extreme, the, the, the moderately respectable degree of predictability which uh, natural selection provides. 
we have these two opposite lessons to take away from the evolution of life, and both of us should give us cause to give thanks for our existence, our individual existence, clearly, but also give thanks for the existence of evolution itself, which is this astonishing process which contrived to take the blind forces of physics, which are the same all over the universe, and by this remarkable process of evolution by natural selection, produce, at least on this planet, this wondrous panoply of complexity, of beauty, and the illusion of design, an illusion of design so strong that it has fooled almost everybody who's ever lived and caused uh, humanity to wait until the middle of the 19th century before two traveling naturalists worked out that it actually wasn't design. I talked about this predictive force, this, this force of evolution which is pushing life in a particular direction. Evolution is progressive. It's not a very fashionable thing to say nowadays. Um, I feel inclined to, tell, to say beware of false prophets claiming not to be what they are pleased to call adaptationists, a foolish word, at the same level of straw-mandering foolishness as that other favorite word, reductionist. Beware of false prophets who try to tell you that evolution is not progressive. Certainly, evolution is not progressive, if by progressive you mean progressive towards humanity. But evolution is progressive in the following sense. When you've got a complicated adaptation, like an eye, something that bears the apparent stamp of design all over it, an eye or an ear, say, then it is absolutely obvious that evolution of that had to be pr progressive. It started out as something that could barely see anything at all. It had to, for logical reasons. You can't suddenly get an eye that sees. It had to be a rudimentary eye that could hardly see anything at all. And now we have the eye of an eagle, the eye of a hawk, the eye of a human, which is a superb instrument with variable focusing, with variable stopping down, color vision, uh, correction for, for aberration, and the, all the computational machinery behind it that goes to analyze the scene in highly sophisticated ways. The, the building up of complex adaptations like that is, of course, progressive, and it has a strong vein of predictability. It's been calculated that, that eyes or optical apparatus have evolved some dozens of times independently around the animal kingdom. And one can say the same thing of ears. In the case of echolocation, sonar, uh, it's evolved at least four times. In bats, as is well known, in toothed whales, and in two independent families of birds. I don't know how many times nervous systems have evolved, but we can say that enlargements of the nervous system that could be called brains have evolved in several different invertebrate groups. And big brains, brains big enough to be plausibly argued as conscious, have evolved several times within the vertebrates, certainly in primates, uh, in whales, in carnivores, in elephants, and probably some others. Simon Conway Morris, the Cambridge paleontologist, has even gone so far as to suggest that humans, or at any rate, uh, bipedal creatures with big brains, stereoscopic forward-looking eyes, and skillful manipulating hands would have evolved again if the tape of life had been rerun, if you could restart evolution, say at the origin of the mammals, perhaps at the origin of the vertebrates. This is an interesting thought experiment, the idea of rerunning the tape of evolution. It was originally suggested by the American biologist Stuart Kaufman, and he used it in a very interesting way. Uh, and I, I like to use it from time to time. I think Conray Morris is probably going a bit far when he says that humans would certainly have evolved again. Um, he's certainly going too far when he says that it is evidence for his weird belief in Christianity. But I think he's not going much too far when he speculates that something like humans is not that improbable to have evolved more than once. 
Now, natural selection, as I've said, is the great engine of the predictable half of what I'm talking about today. Natural selection is predictable, natural selection is lawful, natural selection will produce the sort of results that, uh, that it has produced before. We can see that in the natural experiment of Australia, South America, and the old world mammals, and we can predict now that if some catastrophe were to wipe out the mammals in the same way as a meteorite wiped out the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous, we can predict here and now that if there are some surviving vertebrates, uh, they will evolve into a similar range of ecological types as the mammals produced several times over in different parts of the world, as the dinosaurs produced before them, as the uh, so-called mammal-like reptiles produced before that. You're going to get the same range of carnivores, big carnivores, middle-sized carnivores, small carnivores, ditto for herbivores. You're going to get gliding animals, burrowing animals, gnawing animals. These are all predictable things. The, the great predictable engine of evolution, however, requires the other half of the equation, the luck, the contingency, in order to get through certain stages. And I think the origin of life is the obvious one here. Once the origin of life has happened, and that means once you have the arising on a planet of some kind of self-replicating coded information, which not only makes copies of itself, but which influences the world, on this planet it does it through the processes of embryology, influencing the world so as to affect its own probability of surviving and uh, being replicated. Once you have that, natural selection takes over, the engine of predictability takes over, and you can, you can be sure, not sure, but you can say it's very likely that something like the range of life forms that we see will come to pass. But the first step might be a very, very lucky step indeed. It might be the kind of lucky step with which I began when I encouraged you to bless your own luck for your own personal existence. How lucky was the origin of life? We actually don't know. Uh, Theories of the origin of life are so far, uh, none of them conclusively, uh, e even, very, even highly plausible. So this is one of our, the great gaps in our knowledge, and people are working on it actively, and it's a very good thing that they are. To ask the question, how lucky is the origin of life, is tantamount to asking, how many times do we think life has arisen independently around the universe? And our present state of knowledge allows us to countenance all extremes. It could, on the one hand, be true that life has arisen only once anywhere in the universe, or at the other extreme, it could be that the universe is simply teeming with life. My gut feeling, for what it's worth, and it's worth almost nothing, is that life is probably reasonably common around the universe in the sense that there probably are some millions of independent evolutions of life dotted around the universe. But the number of planets in the universe is so vast, in the billions of billions, that even if there, even if there are a million independent planets, all of whom have independently evolved life, they could still be so far scattered away from each other that no one life form on these islands of life ever has any likelihood of encountering or even knowing about any of the others. I've told you my gut feeling, and I've told you that it's not worth anything. Gut feelings on the whole are not worth anything. But the following is not a gut feeling. The following is a logical deduction. If you are one of those who wants to believe, in other words, whose gut feeling is that life has arisen only once in the universe, and there are many whose intuition points that way, then I will now deduce for you a consequence that you may find extremely paradoxical. If it is true that life has arisen only once 
in the universe. Of course, it has to be here because here we are talking about it. Then that means that the event that we call the origin of life has to be an event of such stupefying improbability because of all the billions of planets that any chemist who is working in the lab trying to find a plausible theory of the origin of life is totally and utterly wasting his time. We don't want a plausible theory of the origin of life. The only theory that should satisfy us if we are one of those who thinks that we are the only life form in the universe, the only theory of the origin of life that should satisfy us is a deeply, deeply implausible theory. Because if it were plausible, then life would have arisen many times. Let me now go back to an earlier candidate for a stroke of blinding luck that might have been necessary in order for us to be here. And this is going right back uh, long before the origin of life, which probably happened uh, between three and four billion years ago, uh, back to the origin of the universe and the laws of physics. Several physicists have argued that the uh, origin of the laws of physics and the physical constants was an event of, tr of, of tremendous luck. Martin Rees, the present astronomer royal in, in Britain and the uh, president of the Royal Society of London, has written a nice little book called, I think, Just Six Numbers, in which he takes six of the fundamental constants of physics. These are numbers that physicists know the value of with great accuracy, but don't have any rationale for why they have those values. Given that they've got those values, then physicists can deduce an awful lot of other things and they build their, their edifice of physics on them. But at present, they don't know why these constants have those values. And Martin Rees and others have calculated that if any of those constants had different values, then the universe as we know it couldn't exist and life couldn't have evolved. So there are things like the gravitational constant, the weak force, the strong force, and so on. And the image that you could imagine is that at the origin of the universe there are six knobs that you can twiddle. And these are tuning knobs. And uh, every one of these six knobs has to be twiddled to exactly the right tuning position. Because if any one of them is a tiny bit off the uh, correct value, then the universe wouldn't happen. For example, if the gravitational constant was wrong, uh, the universe would never have got beyond the stage of being distributed hydrogen, uh, galaxies would never have formed, stars would never have condensed. Um, that means that there would never be um, chemistry. The, 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 the heavier elements, anything heavier than hydrogen, would never have been forged in the interior of stars because there wouldn't be any stars. So, and you can do the same thing for twiddling any of those six knobs. Well, if we accept the notion of fine tuning, we have something that we need to explain. Not all physicists do accept it. Uh, Victor Stenger, uh, who's written some excellent books and could, could be a candidate for what you might call the fifth horseman. Victor Stenger, has pointed out that the assumption that people like Rees have made is that you're twiddling these knobs one at a time. So you hold, all, you hold the other five constant, and then you, you twiddle one of them, and then you show that the whole universe collapses if you, if you twiddle the one knob. But what if you twiddle more than one at once? That makes the calculation much harder. It means that the, that the range of possible universes becomes enormously uh, increased, and it could very well be then that it's no longer true that the fine-tuning argument holds. It could be that there are actually lots of universes which could give rise to some form of life. We also have to remember that we may have a rather blinkered view of life because we are, um, it's been called carbon chauvinism. Um, we, are, uh, we, we, we think of life as being our kind of life. But suppose we, uh, we, we take seriously the uh, suggestion of Martin Rees and others that the universe really is fine-tuned, then 
what conclusion or how might we, how might we deal with that suggestion? The first thing to say is even if the universe is fine-tuned, we should not uh, jump to or even countenance the conclusion that some conscious intelligence had to be there to do the fine-tuning. I mean, that really would be a lousy argument because um, it, it doesn't solve any problems at all. The, the whole exercise is to explain how it is that a very improbable set of state of affairs came into being. The, st the improbable state of affairs is, of course, the correct value of all, th all the six constants. Um, to postulate a divine knob twiddler Why is that funny, I wonder? <laughs> to postulate a divine tuner <laughs> who knows, who knew the exact values of the, of the six knobs, of the, of the six uh, tunings. To postulate a divine tuner is, is, is tantamount to simply saying, well, let them be tuned in the first place. It doesn't explain anything. And this is a familiar argument which we meet over and over again. It's the, it's the big argument that theists just don't get. Martin Rees and others uh, resort to what's been called the anthropic principle, which weirdly theists seem to think is, is, is their property. Actually, the anthropic principle is a deeply atheistic principle. Um, the anthropic principle states that all observable universes must have whatever properties it takes to give rise to life, otherwise there would be nobody to observe them. Now, on the face of it, uh, just as stated, that's rather unsatisfying because it still seems to, le to leave unexplained why it is. I mean, it's one thing to say that b because this universe is being observed, there is no choice but for it to have the correct values of the fundamental constants. But that still leaves us a bit unsatisfied. We still don't actually quite see why it has those values. So you combine the anthropic principle with the multiverse theory or the megaverse theory, which derives from other parts of physics, such as the inflationary universe uh, theory. The idea that the universe that we observe is only one of billions of universes which are like bubbles in a foam, mutually incommunicado, and the, an observer in any one universe is unable to see any of the others. And these different universes have different values of their fundamental constants, maybe just random values, or maybe they give birth to baby universes which have mutated values or something of that sort. And now if you've got billions of universes with different values of the fundamental constants, now the anthropic principle really can kick in in a plausible way. Because we now say that there may only be a small minority of universes that, has the that have the correct values, where correct means conducive to making stars, making chemistry, and making life. There may only be a minority of universes that have these properties. But of course, we have to be in one of those, one of that minority, because here we are observing it. So that, I think, is actually rather a satisfying theory. Physicists don't find it satisfying. I don't quite know why not. I think it's actually rather, rather elegant, maybe because it's a kind of quasi-Darwinian theory. It's not really Darwinian. There is, there is a more Darwinian version of it, which is that of the theoretical physicist Lee Smolin who suggests that not only is there a multiverse of many universes, but that the universes really do give birth to baby universes in the events that are called, physicists call black holes. At the moment of birth, a baby universe inherits the physical constants of its parent, but slightly mutated, slightly mutated. Now you see you have the raw material for a true evolution of universes, a true evolutionary progression of universes, where fitness for a universe means whatever it takes to give birth to baby universes, that's what fitness always means to a biologist. And what it takes to give birth to a baby universe is such things as lasting long enough 
to give birth. It's no good if the universe fizzles out in the first femtosecond, which some of them would do if you've got the tuning wrong. They've got to last long enough. They've got to have whatever it takes to make galaxies and stars. You've got to have stars. You can't have chemistry. You can't have life if you don't have chemistry. So life could be a, a byproduct of whatever it takes to make a fertile universe, whatever it takes to evolve the kind of universe that is good at making baby universes. It's not that life itself is part of the fitness in the, in the Smolin model. It's rather that uh, life happens to be a byproduct of other properties that cause a universe to have fitness in the Smolin model. Smolin's theory has not found favor with other physicists, but I think it's hard to find a strong objection to it in this rather speculative area of physics. So a combination of one-shot mega luck in the origin of the universe, perhaps, and uh, in the origin of life, so we've got one-shot mega luck on the one hand, and we've got the predictable processes, the lawful processes that give rise to chemistry in the first place, and then that give rise to the evolution of life in the second place, which has a strong element of predictability in, in it. Both of those processes are wondrous, amazing, and they are cause for us to give thanks. Give thanks? Give thanks to whom? Or to what? To providence? To the fairies? To the gods? I want to turn, finally, to this rather strange question because I think it bears upon another interesting question, which is why we have religion at all. It's a question that I, as a Darwinian, have often been asked. And I think it deserves an answer because religion does appear to be, in some sense, a human universal. It doesn't mean that all individuals are religious, far from it. This, this wonderful audience is testimony to that. But in the same way as heterosexual lust is a human universal, even though not all individuals have it. Uh, anthropologists will tell us that all cultures that have ever been looked at have something that you could call religion. And that seems to demand an explanation, uh, various kinds of explanation, and from a Darwinian it demands a Darwinian explanation. In The God Delusion, I speculated that it's not religion itself that has a Darwinian survival value. But this is a very common thing that we have to do, uh, we adaptationists. We don't say, what is the adaptive significance of this particular thing we happen to be observing? We say, this particular thing we happen to be, to be observing may be a byproduct of something else. And that something else may be what is being favored by natural selection. So perhaps there are, perhaps there's a cluster of psychological predispositions which have survival value because of some of their consequences in nature. And religion may be an inadvertent consequence, an extra consequence, a byproduct, which only manifests itself under certain circumstances, presumably the right cultural circumstances. I mentioned as one possible example of a psychological predisposition, the predisposition, especially in child minds, to obey authority, to believe what your parents tell you. And I speculated that uh, there would be strong survival value in children to believe parents when parents give good advice about life, about danger, about uh, not um, walking into the fire or not walking over cliffs or that kind of thing. And I suggested that a byproduct of this built-in rule of thumb, which the brain is programmed with, that says, believe what your parents tell you, a byproduct of that would be vulnerability to mental viruses, such as religion, in the same way as, a, as a, an electronic computer is vulnerable to computer viruses by the very virtue of the fact that it is programmable, the computer has no, no way of knowing 
whether the program that it's being given is a good program, uh, like a word processor or a spreadsheet or something of that sort, or whether it's a bad program, like a virus, which simply says, um, spread yourself, copy, copy this program, and while you're about it, uh, delete this poor person's doctoral thesis. <laughs> so that was the suggestion that I made in The God Delusion, and that was, but I made it clear that this was only one candidate for a psychological predisposition that might have a byproduct of religion. And today I want to mention a couple of other possible psychological predispositions, and one of them is gratitude abstract gratitude, the gratitude that I've been encouraging you in the first part of my talk to feel towards what? A vacuum, a gratitude for your own existence. The human species is an intensely social species. We swim through a sea of each other. We need to cooperate, we need to bargain, we need to trade. Once upon a time, each family probably fended pretty much for itself, and I don't know how, maybe the father went out hunting and the mother gathered berries and this kind of thing. Um, and there may have been some barter and trade between families, but barter and trade became really important when different skills developed, when people were growing different kinds of crops, or when perhaps um, trades like smiths arose who had a skill that they could trade, they could trade digging implements with farmers who needed them in exchange for food, say. So I'm trying to build up the case for, for viewing bargaining, trading, as being a very, very important part of human life and the need to develop the appropriate calculating machinery for mediating trade and bargaining. Eventually, money was invented, and money serves as a handy and um, easy to count, easy to keep uh, token for debt, for who owes what to whom. But before money was invented, we would have needed some sort of mental money, something equivalent to money which enabled us, our ancestors, to keep a precise count of who owes what to whom. The bit of our brain that calculates fairness, obligation, debt, grudge, gratitude, the mental money calculator develops early, which is why even small children are so obsessed with fairness. One of the commonest things you'll ever hear a child cry is, not fair! They will say that even when the entity accused of being not fair is not another human being at all, not another child, but, for example, the weather. It's not fair that it should rain on my birthday, as though the weather cared for anybody's birthday. So you see where I'm going. I'm, I'm trying to build up the picture of, of the idea of gratitude and uh, the, co the concept of debt as, so to speak, going off in a vacuum when there may or may not be a real target of this uh, debt calculator. I think that the debt calculator, the mental money machine in the brain, became so well developed that it possibly is the origin of our ability to do mathematics at all, which is an emergent property which has often puzzled people. Why on earth is it that we have this capacity to do these extraordinary um, calculations and higher mathematics? Maybe it all started with the debt calculator, with the fairness calculator. And just as sexual lust can, in a sense, go off in a vacuum, sexual lust is built into the brain for obvious biological reasons to do with reproduction, but the sexual lust remains even when cognitively we know perfectly well that there's nothing to do with reproduction. We use contraceptives and it doesn't diminish our lust one whit. 
That's because natural selection doesn't build, in, build into our brains a cognitive awareness of why we're doing things, cognitive awareness of the need to propagate our selfish genes. Far from it. Rules of thumb are built into the brain because they have the consequence in nature under normal conditions, where there aren't any contraceptives, for example, of propagating our selfish genes. So we have a lust for sex for that reason, and I'm suggesting that we have a similar lust to calculate debt, indebtedness, gratitude, guilt, grudges. And it's such a powerful lust that it goes off in a vacuum. I talked about children saying it's unfair that it rained on their birthday. And we can also feel gratitude if we get a fine day for our birthday. Uh, we thank Providence. We, we say thank God. And this. You can see where I'm going, as I say, this may be one of the psychological predispositions that leads us to postulate gods. When a hurricane destroys our village, destroys every, everyone we know, or an earthquake or a tsunami, then we may say, what did we do to deserve this? How could this happen? I've been good all my life. I've, I've never sinned in my life. Why did this happen to me? We've heard this over and over again. Or even more strangely, when the hurricane or the tsunami kills 100,000 people and one child is discovered to be alive, clinging to driftwood with nothing worse than a broken leg, and we say, thank God my child is safe. Never mind the other 100,000. God saved my child. We're constantly projecting onto abstract entities, projecting out into the vacuum these feelings which are our debt calculator, our grudge calculator, our gratitude calculator going off in a vacuum. Vacuum activity is a technical term in ethology, the, the biological study of animal behavior, which is the discipline in which I was trained. Uh, a vacuum activity is what happens when an animal does a piece of its normal behavioral repertoire, but out of context, when the normal stimulus for that behavior is no longer present. Uh, I have seen, you may well have seen, a dog burying a, a bone where there is no soil to bury with. And the dog will uh, push non-existent soil, damn sorry, non-existent soil with its muzzle. It's a beautiful sight to see. Uh, it's, 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 it, one doesn't want to say the dog thinks there's soil there. That's not the way to put it. Um, when, a, when a man lusts after a, a photograph of a naked woman, he doesn't think there really is a naked woman. It's just that the lust goes off in a vacuum. Similarly, the dog is pushing vacuum soil. There is no soil, tamping it down. I've seen a wonderful film of a beaver. You, you know, beavers build dams, and it's a very um, complicated procedure. It involves gathering wood, gathering logs, cutting down trees, putting the logs into a dam. The reason for it is that making a dam is good for the beaver's survival. It provides a safe waterway for the beaver to forage in and so on. But so beavers have this lust to build dams. And the film I saw was a beaver in a bare room with a concrete floor and nothing in the room. There was no river to dam. There were no twigs. There were no logs. There were no sticks. The beaver was picking up phantom logs and putting them into the phantom dam, tamping them down, arranging them, rearranging them, going off to get another phantom log. This is behavior going off in a vacuum. The beaver has a lust to build a dam. So I'm suggesting that this vacuum activity, which we see in beavers, which we see in dogs, vacuum nut burying in squirrels and so on, that vacuum gratitude and the, and the reverse, bearing grudges against those individuals who don't pay their debts. Vacuum gratitude and similar things is one of the psychological predispositions that has led people to religion, along with probably quite a lot of other 
psychological predispositions. So that's a possible evolutionary reason why we feel an urge to give thanks, even when we know that there's nobody to thank. It's nothing to be ashamed of, and I hope that the first part of my talk gave sufficient reason for our gratitude to be alive, even if it is gratitude in a vacuum. And I end with my gratitude to you for listening. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity for Q&A. And I'll start from the top. Can we have the house lights up? Yes, so we can see as much as we can. Uh, Richard, oh, that um, looks better. Yeah, I Thank just you. was wondering, you mentioned... Uh, Could you wave wherever you are? He's right up okay, there. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, you mentioned religion, religion being a byproduct of our machinery and we're sort of witnessing a rise of atheism at, at the moment. Um, but I'm just wondering what your thoughts are long term in regard to rational thinkers that perhaps could be a dying breed if, um, if there are selective, selective pressures for, um, away from being a free thinker, if, the, if there's some sort of genetic predisposition um, around being a believer or being a, 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 or for rational thought. So I'm, I'm sort of guessing yeah. that I, I think the, that's, the, the, I think the that's too here, pessimistic. I, I think you're being too, too pessimistic. Of course, it's, it's only my guess. Yeah. Um, I like to think that um, well, audiences like this show, show evidence that if you actually can get to people and talk to them, um, there are quite a lot of people that you can convince to be rational. Um, I think if, you, if, if you're moved to pessimism by the thought that uh, we, we have at any particular time political movements which seem to be gaining power. I mean, uh, we, we've had eight years of, of Bush theocracy in, in, in America, for example, which, which naturally was very discouraging. But I think if you take the broad sweep of history, you're bound to expect a kind of sawtooth. If you've got a general trend upwards, you're going to get a kind of sawtooth like that. It's a bit like saying that because we happen to, to have a, a, a cold winter, Therefore, global warming is nonsense, that, that kind of thing. I mean, you, do, you don't want to take too much notice of short-term, high-frequency changes. You want to what look I, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the general um, trend. Sorry? sorry? What I was thinking was perhaps the birth rate of the people in this room might be lower than that of any reli particular relig religious group. Well, that, that is a worry, but, but bear in mind that that assumes the, the iniquitous assumption that children inherit the religion of their, of their parents. Unfortunately, there's a lot of truth in that, but I think that's one of the things we've really got to try to work on, is to try to break that cycle, whereby the assumption that if members of religion X have a higher birth rate than, than people who think Y, that that means that people who think X is going to increase. I mean, that, if you think about it, that, that is an additional assumption, the additional assumption that, that children inherit the religion of their, of their parents. And if we could do anything to stop that, I think education would be the, the real focal point that we, ought to be, that we ought to be zeroing in on. Okay, we have a question from the middle there, right there. Yes? Oh, hi, my name's Alistair. Excuse my nervousness. Um, Richard, I've read all of your books and I can't put them down, so thank you. Um, my question, I guess, is... You call yourself an atheist, and, and in The God Delusion, you state that um, does God exist is a scientific question. And I agree with that. And I came to the conclusion that I'm agnostic. I almost, I just can't believe there's a God, but there's that tiny, tiny chance. So therefore, I'd call myself agnostic, a secularist. However, you call yourself an atheist, as I imagine everyone in this room, or most people in this room would. My question, I guess, in essence is, is there not the same chance of dogmatism in that definition as there is in any religion? Well, I 
don't actually call myself an atheist in, in one sense, that, that if, if you look in the God Delusion, I've got this seven-point scale um, where uh, one are people who know there is a God and seven are people who know there isn't, and I pulled myself, I think, a 6.9 or something like that. Um, <laughs> The, I mean, we are all agnostic about really everything because you can't actually disprove um, the existence of, you know the argument, fairies and leprechauns and, and things. So I'm an, I'm an atheist in the same way as I'm an afariest, and, and we're all... Um, uh, and, and we're all atheorists as well. Um, you... You say, mightn't there be a chink? Well, there could be all sorts of chinks. There are millions of possible chinks. There, there are chinks of fairies, chinks of leprechauns, chinks of all, all sorts of things. The onus on somebody who wants to... The, the onus is on somebody who wants to believe positively in the existence of something for which there is no evidence. And so uh, we should simply shove all gods into the same dustbin as we shove fairies, leprechauns, Thor, Zeus, Mithras... Uh, Etc. Et uh, down the front here. Yes, hello, my name's Justin Milligan. Uh, I must say I'm quite, uh, I feel quite lucky uh, having the opportunity to ask you a question. I assume something must have caused that. Um, <laughs> the, my, my question is uh, with, regard to the, uh, with regard to the width of applicability of, evol of evolutionary principles. Uh, we're quite familiar with cell selecting for survival through, uh, in sometimes using cooperative behaviour, uh, and that's evolved us towards actually having a brain, and I guess that's the ultimate adaptive system that we have available to us. It allows us to adapt to a very wide range of, of uh, pressures that may apply to us. Is, is what we think part of the evolutionary process? Is there a natural selection? Is is the war of ideas part of the natural selection process? And can a group of similarly cooperating um, systems, such as humans in a society, evolve that society forward using those principles? You have to be careful, don't you? Because um, brains clearly are the product of, of natural selection, and they got big because of natural selection. But what brains do is then very largely emergent. And so you, you wouldn't wish to say that um, that there's natural selection between, say, different languages, between English and German and French and Spanish and things. You wouldn't wish to say that there's natural selection of this great edifice, this great cathedral of, of, of flowering that brains, brains produce. It's the capacity to do that building that is naturally selected. Now, there may be some other kind of natural selection going on, something that is um, analogous to biological natural selection, the true genetic natural selection. I think it's important not to get carried away and to slide too easily, to, to, too slipperily from one kind of selection to another. Um, natural selection proper means the differential survival of genes in gene pools. There may be analogous differential survival of ideas in idea pools or groups in group pools and there may be, uh, or even universes in universe pools, if we take the Lee Smolin uh, argument seriously. But I, I'm, I'm all for clarity in language, and so although it's nice to develop analogies and, and notice similarities, it's also important to keep the distinctions clear in our minds as well. There is something marvelous and wonderful about the, um, the emergent properties of, of the human brain, the fact that we produce art and and, and um, music and language and all the things that the human brain does produce. And this is all an example of the, the emergent power of natural selection, but it's not natural selection itself. Up the top. Hi, Richard. Um, when we're in school, um, we learn how to critically argue. So, for example, if we're told, uh, read this book and give your opinion, we have to support that with evidence. Now, most people, be them atheists or theists, will take that skill with them later into life. But how is it that, in your opinion, when it comes to their personal beliefs with regard to religion, they're able to put this down and just accept it on face value? 
is remarkable. Um, I, I guess you speak with feeling from your home country. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, it is remarkable, isn't it, that the sort of people who, in their everyday life, when they're planning a holiday, planning a journey, planning to go grocery shopping or how to mend their car, and anything like, use perfectly good logical reasoning, skeptical reasoning, you know, what might have gone wrong with the car, you, you eliminate things, you, do, you, 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 do, you use a sort of scientific method and you use logic and reason and sense. And then when it comes to religion, it all goes right out of the window. And these very same individuals who show no deficiency in any other field of life, their entire mental... I mean, Christopher Hitchens says religion poisons everything. It does, and it certainly poisons the ability to use your brain. <laughs> In the middle, in the middle there. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Dawkins. I'm not an atheist, and I will give thanks and gratitude to God tonight for, for my life and for being a part of the design and purpose. What I would like to ask you is about DNA. Can you tell me what DNA is? What comprises DNA? What underpins DNA, and um, why are we all unique? No, no, please, 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 please. Uh, yes, uh, could 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 you just finish your question? Sorry. Do you want them again? Well, I th I think I was. G you you asked me a lot of questions about about DNA, and I, yes. I got lost because of the because okay. of Okay. What I'd like to know is what is DNA, and what underpins the DNA. Right. And also, where does it come from? And or unique. Right. Um, DNA is, uh, is a very high-tech um, replicator. It is the replicator which underlies natural selection as we know it in life, in the whole of life today. Um, all living creatures have the same genetic code, give or take a few tiny details, and this means that uh, it's almost certain that all living creatures are descended from the same common ancestor, the same origin of, of life. It's a very, very strong deduction uh, from the fact that the, uh, you, that the genetic code is universal. That does not mean, however, that even though we are all descended from a, a common ancestor that used the DNA protein system, which is a very, very high-tech uh, system of interaction between molecules that have different abilities, DNA for replication, protein for influencing the world, for influencing embryology, for catalyzing chemical reactions and doing it thereby. The DNA protein system very probably was not the original system which started the evolutionary process off on this planet. It seems, as Graham Cairn Smith has argued and others have argued, that DNA is probably a late usurper that came on the scene after an earlier forerunner which we no longer have any trace of, an earlier replicator that did something like the same job as DNA, something like the same self-replicating job as DNA, but was not DNA, was a low-tech replicator. The problem with DNA as a high-tech replicator is that it requires protein in order to do its job of self-replication. So that's what's been called the cat 22 of the origin of life. So the Cairn-Smith idea, and I think it's probably right in general, although his particular candidate for the, pre, for the precursor probably may, may not be, he thought it was inorganic crystals. I think he's right that something had to come before DNA. And the most promising candidate at the moment is the so-called RNA world theory. If you think about it, DNA is very good at replication, protein is very good at being an enzyme, and each of them is lousy at doing the other thing. Uh, protein is a, is a hopeless replicator because a protein molecule is all tied up in a knot, and therefore the amino acid sequence that defines the protein uh, is not accessible, it cannot be read out in the way that uh, you can read out the sequence of, 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 D, of DNA. So protein's a good catalyst, DNA is a good replicator, each is, a, is lousy at doing the other. RNA is reasonably good at doing both. RNA is a replicator in the same kind of system as DNA, and RNA is also not a very good catalyst, but it, is a, it, it, is, it can serve as an enzyme. 
And so the RNA world theory is that before DNA took over, it was RNA that served both roles, both the replicator and the, um, and the executive role of, of, of enzyme. And that DNA came in as a later takeover. And I find that an, an, an appealing theory, um, but there may be others. And as I said in my lecture, um, the, 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 or, the origin of life is, a, is, a, is at present a, a gap in our knowledge. We have a question down the front. Hi, I've got a question about Mary McKillop. Um, later this year, we'll have our first saint. Sorry, Mary, about who? Mary McKillop. Australia's first okay, saint. Okay, right, got it, yeah. Okay. Um, later this year, we'll have our first saint. Um, do you, first of all, I wanted to ask you if, if you think it'll do us any harm having a saint. And that's a serious question. And um, do you find it discouraging that it's been uh, reported very credulously by the media and even with gratitude by people like our Prime Minister? Yes, I, I do find it discouraging. I mean, what, it, it's the, the whole idea of creating saints, I mean, it's pure Monty Python. The idea that... <laughs> the idea that they have to clock up two miracles. I mean, the, these are people we're supposed to take seriously. These are the people who, when I'm accused of going after the easy targets, the fundamental nutbags, why don't you take on a real theologian? Well, the real theologians that one could take on are people who believe that Mary MacKillop, or whatever she's called, and, and, um, uh, and Pope Nazi, whatever he, he was... Uh, um, <laughs> ..have miracles, and they actually solemnly get doctors to give testimony that somebody got better from cancer, somebody showed remission. From, from cancer after being, I don't know, prayed over or something like that. I mean, as I said, that, that, that's just uh, sur surreal, and it completely gives the lie to the claim that sophisticated theologians somehow should be able to, be, to look down upon the, the, the fundamentalist wingnuts. They're all the same. The upper gallery again. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my question is, uh, when do you think we will be able to criticize Islam without threatening our very existence? <laughs> On the face of it, it's a remarkably effective tactic, isn't it, to say, OK, I've lost the argument, therefore, if you, if you try to argue against me, I'll cut your head off. Um, it's really an, an admission of defeat. Um, I am not one of those who thinks that we should uh, go out of our way to insult Islam recklessly or uh, foolishly because um, it doesn't do any good to get your head cut off. Um, <laughs> what we should say is something like this. I may give way to you, I may refrain from, uh, what shall we say, publishing a cartoon of, of your, your prophet, but it's because I fear you. Don't for one moment think it's because I respect you. enjoyed uh, your talk very much. Just one very brief question. Are there any identifiable organic or physical differences between the brain and mind of an atheist as opposed to the brain and mind of a religious person? This is very difficult. I mean, there, there, there are people who are trying to do uh, experiments on shoving people into MRI scanners and uh, comparing uh, 
uh, people who have different beliefs or comparing people who are thinking different thoughts. This is a very exciting, growing uh, area of, of research. I think we're going to see a lot more of it in the future. Um, I, I think it would be premature to try to, I mean, there are sort of little straws in the wind, but I think it would be premature to, 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 to try to, to say anything about it yet. I guess they're probably, in some sense, there have got to be differences between all our brains that determine uh, or, have, or are, are associated with our various differences in beliefs, our tastes, what, our taste in music, our taste in food. These all, in some sense, have got to have physiological cor correlates. But I think it, we've got a long way before we can actually produce anything very, very clear on, on answering that question. To Australia, thank you. Adam, thank you for coming to Australia and talking in front of us. It's a great privilege. The question is, um, I read a book by Tamas who's also spoken tonight, it's called Against Religion. Um, now, I may not be representing the thesis of this book accurately. It's just my interpretation of the idea, so sorry if I get it wrong, Tamas, if you're still here. It's about um, the narcissism of youth being a candidate for a motivator to religion in later life. It's, um, so it's based around the idea that you, when you're young, and when you're very useful, you don't have an, a, a very distinct idea of, it, um, of the difference between yourself, the inner world, and the outside world. And so it gives you like this narcissistic feeling of om omnipotence and you cry and something will happen and you'll get sustenance. Um, but later you have to move out of a metaphorical Eden into like, a, and lose your ignorance um, and gain the power to model the world around you. And I, I think I'm going to stop you. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you with great interest, but it, this, this is going to amount to you giving me a tutorial on what he says because I haven't read it. And so I don't think I'm going to be able to give you an interesting answer. Uh, what I must do is go away and read it. Um, and thank you for calling Good. it to my attention. But I don't think I can actually give you a, a very interesting answer to your, to your question. OK, just a quick one. Okay. Would a Deinonychus evolve into a form that would adopt religion, given enough time and enough patience? Anything might evolve into anything else, given enough time and, and enough patience. The question is, would it be at all likely? Uh, and the answer is probably not. Uh, the middle row again, up there. Um, you were talking about uh, the mental dispositions uh, that could lead to religion. And I was wondering if there are also cultural dispositions, which are uh, a mix of mental uh, dispositions, uh, which could lead to religion. And uh, I was wondering if in the animal kingdom, uh, which you're very well versed in, whether or not there would be any which uh, resemble something which could bring about the context for religion in, say, the past? Yes, well, I think it goes without saying that, that, that there are cultural predispositions. That, of course, is immensely important. As a, as a, a, biologi a biological Darwinian, I was trying to find a, a, a biological Darwinian explanation for religion, and it goes without saying that, it, that culture is going to be the medium in which that actually happens. And my suggestion was that biological, psychological predispositions manifest themselves as religion in the right cultural context. Are there animals? that have a culture which could be regarded as, in any sense, religious, non-human animals, of course, we must say, because we are animals. Um, people have suggested, uh, I think that the most um, haunting suggestion comes from the work on elephants by Ian Douglas Hamilton and others, suggesting that elephants have a respect for their dead and show some kind of, something that looks like reverence uh, for the dead. Uh, and. Uh, you know, but these are anecdotes. Who knows what to say about them? It's, it, I, I find it moving, um, and I don't know that I want to make a, a strong case that you could call this something like religion. And I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for. Please, thank you again. Thank you.